Hello, I'm Stephen Mitchell. I'd like to welcome you to another of my uh, Notes on a Call Sheet podcast. Today I want to pick up on a uh, catchphrase I tend to use in uh, my instructions to actors. and It's surfaced in various seminars and webinars I've given over the years. But uh, it goes something like this. If it feels right, it's probably wrong. This applies to uh, an acting performance you give. And I've had so many times over the years when uh, an actor will say, well, it felt really right. And uh, then they come to see that they didn't get the part that they were going for. And on inspection, when we'd look at things and they'd tape things and they'd say, this feels really right. We'd look at it and then we'd see, oh dear, there's something very off here that that the actor didn't pick up on subjectively as he or she delivered the performance. There's a reason for this. What feels right to an actor as they perform a scene is something that is given in the speed and size of real life. This is what we're accustomed to day to day, minute by minute. Real life is what feels real and natural to us. Unfortunately, a performance given by an actor isn't real life. It's not meant to be real life. In fact, my definition of acting is exaggeration in order to make a point. What are we exaggerating? Well, any number of things. In real life, we tend to hide our thoughts. In acting, we want to show them, not not too blatantly and, and not in a way that makes it obvious we're trying to uh, deliver a message, but we want to let our feelings and thoughts show in a way that, that uh, however subtle it is, it still communicates and resonates with the audience. A good example of why real life isn't workable as a performance um, is to go into any environment where they have a surveillance cam with a monitor on display. Typically in America, in any gas station, when you go in, you can pay for your purchases in their mini-mart Some restaurants, fast foods, have uh, surveillance camera monitors on display. But the next time you're in one of those places, take a look at the uh, surveillance cam monitor and watch it for a while and see how watchable it really is or isn't. That's what you're watching there is real life happening. It's the size and speed of real life. And you'll notice that it's very uninteresting to watch. There's nothing to see. It's as though everyone is trying to be there without taking up any space or sending any particular message, unless somebody's getting irritated because the line's too long and they want to get get on with it. You may see some show of uh, agitation or anger, but typically, unless you're watching one of those surveillance monitors on Facebook or YouTube where a guy comes in with a gun and starts holding everybody up. Typically, uh, the, the, what really happens in real life is not much of a performance and not worth watching and not worth delivering as a product in a movie. I know it's popular to say we want real life in our acting and I take issue with that. I don't think that's what we really want, but I think what we what we what we mean when we say that is that we want the appearance of real life as opposed to someone obviously acting and not getting the job done very well that's what we don't want but what we want is something that's going to connect with us and move us and make us feel emotions that uh that either we want validated that we're already feeling or emotions that are somewhat alien to us and yet somewhat fascinating. We want to know 
what it's like to be in that position. And actors, when they deliver their performance, understanding this, know to resonate everybody in the audience using typically interstitials, but not exclusively interstitial reactions. And you want it to, how should I say, communicate much more than what's being said with the text, the dialogue. I was giving a new student, um, I wrote a monologue for her, and the first thing we do in action-reaction, the first in the protocol of steps that you use to break down a script, is we phrased out the dialogue, which was not something she'd done before, not something she was used to doing, but she took to it rather well. And as we started learning phrasing and, and uh, emphasis and how to sing the dialogue rather than speak it, um, she began to see that this monologue wasn't a series of sentences, but it was a series of performances contained in a phrase or phrases, a series of phrases sometimes that divided the performance up into many parts, but still were part of a, a larger whole. And I thought that was a very interesting understanding of what acting, I think, what acting should be, is that <clears throat> you don't approach uh, uh, acting as the delivery of a speech. That's that's speechifying, that's giving a lecture or reciting. But I think acting, if you look at, say you're given sides and you have a paragraph uh, that is your first speech, maybe a short paragraph, but there you are. And most actors would see that as a whole and deliver it as a whole. Whereas I would say that speech, that paragraph is made up of several, oh, maybe completed thoughts or semi-completed thoughts and or half half thought out ideas and if you approach that paragraph not as one thing but as three or four things uh, put together but of separate intent each one you start to see that it becomes much more interesting and the message of it and the way it's delivered becomes a little more fascinating, or, or perhaps even a lot more fascinating. And instead of being over and done with in the quick delivery of a paragraph, you're delivering, you're, you're parceling it out into the bits and pieces of what the character thought, or what you as an actor decided the character is thinking, or how they're thinking. And also it tends to come out in this fashion as something the character didn't already know in advance what he was going to say. In other words, some of this he had to make up as he was speaking because he didn't know what was going to come out of his thought process next. It, it gives a more thoughtful and interesting uh, delivery, I think. And is this real life? Well, I think it's a reflection of real life. I think that a lot of our conversations I suppose, are pre-recorded conversations that we've given before and we know what they are so we can deliver them again. I um, like to keep those to a minimum. But in a more real and thoughtful conversation, you're coming up with ideas and thoughts and conclusions as you think and as you speak, which would tend to meter out their delivery in a fashion that would preclude you from speaking it all as a piece. And uh, so I think that when you approach a scene or a speech that way, you are going to feel that you have disrupted the, the pacing, that you are kind of delivering it in a fashion that's clunky and, you know, it has no balance and the delivery is a little wobbly and you know, you're taking forever to say it. And yet, when you look at it, 
what you are observing as a viewer now as opposed to subjectively as a performer you you are now taking on board the meter the pacing the intention those interstitial emotions that come between the phrases that cause you to wonder about what's going on inside the actor's mind none of which you get to do if he delivers it boom 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 a good example of this if you want to get a sense of what I'm talking about is to go to YouTube and look up a fellow named Spalding Gray Spalding Gray a very interesting fellow uh, an intellectual um, a comedian of sorts and he's a monologist or he he would put on one-man shows quite interesting but here's the problem that I have when I'm trying to watch Spalding Gray and and see if this is noticeable to you Spalding never takes a breath for the whole half hour hour that he's <laughs> that he's on camera he speaks, speak, 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 talk, 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 then and then and what and whatever and then what happened and, and then and I think and and the impact of that, of never stopping, of never pausing, of never taking a moment's hesitation or break, is I suppose an interesting style. It is a style identifiable to him. But the problem I have with it is it doesn't give me a chance to participate in the conversation. If he says 10 things in a row, even though I might find the second thing very interesting and I might want to ponder that for a minute, add my own thought to what it is he said or my own reaction to what he said his reaction was, I can't do it. In other words, He's stepping on my my reaction. He's stepping on my thoughts. Now, any good comedian knows that it's vital to leave space for the audience to laugh. Otherwise, you end up giving your set and nobody laughs. Why? Because since you keep talking, you're signaling to the audience that this isn't important, don't laugh, there's a bigger laugh coming, I'm going to keep talking and you can laugh later. It stifles the laugh, it stifles the reaction in the audience, you just don't want to do that. Well, the same is true in a dramatic performance. I don't see any difference, by the way, between comedy and drama. Uh, they're both communication delivered to an audience and, and you have a desired reaction you're trying to promote or provoke. And whether it's tears or anger or laughter is irrelevant. The mechanics of it are the same. So when you speak something, it doesn't mean that every line is going to get a huge laugh. Every comedian certainly knows that. And sometimes the line they thought was going to get a huge laugh gets hardly any reaction at all and something they didn't think was really that funny gets a, an uproarious laugh so we can be surprised. The same is true in a dramatic presentation. So when you don't leave space for the audience to have their sad moment, their reflective moment, their irritation, the laugh that they didn't have that day but you just provided them with something that you did and you step on that you've 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 taken it away from them and now they are forced to be a witness to what you're doing rather than a participant in a way I, I could say this have you ever been in a conversation with someone and they're talking and they say something particularly interesting and you want to say yes you know that happened to me I, I, I had a similar thing when but you can't because they keep on talking. And you, well, I'll, I'll tell them as soon as they stop talking. But then they don't stop talking. Or by the time they do stop talking, what you would have said is no longer relevant. It's in the past. It would be silly to hearken back to that and say, oh, you know, when you five minutes ago when you said this, I had a... <laughs> you know, you just don't do that particularly. 
So the idea, I think, for an actor to understand is though you are involved in a performance and though that performance gives the apparency that your communication is, is directed towards the other actor in the scene. The real communication is not between you and the other actor, but between you and the audience, and the other actor and the audience. What you do with the other actor, however real you try to make it, isn't real. It's a pretended communication for the benefit of the onlooker, the audience. They paid for the ticket, they should get the ride. And understanding that, you start to see why actors who don't take that into account tend to leave the audience out of the equation and the audience feels left out of the equation and they how should I put this, they don't find a connection into the scene. They don't find their way into the scene because it doesn't address them and it doesn't allow them to participate and inject their thoughts. Someone once gave me the definition, a definition of fine art, saying that you, fine art engages the thought process of the onlooker. I suppose this is true of music, sculpture, any kind of painting, uh, literature, as you read. And you want your acting to engage the thought process and, and the emotional process, I think, of the, of the uh, audience. And you do this by drawing them in and having, giving them the moment or two to participate in the performance with you and to figure out what you're thinking and why you said what you said, building your backstory for you, because because they will if you've triggered the curiosity factor. And in that way, you start to see a performance as a complex perf performance of various elements of the text and of the emotional displays <clears throat> and not as a representation of real life. And because it isn't meant to be real life that you see on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the surveillance monitor at the mini mart or at the gas station, there are a lot of things that have to take place. There are a lot of considerations you have to uh, be aware of in order to give the audience the fullest tapestry possible. It's not just a picture of a table. You want something that's on the table and something that's in the background and what's outside the window and what kind of flooring is there. And you want, to, you want it to be as full a tapestry as possible. And this is why if it feels right, it's wrong. Now, if I suppose if you get used to the action-reaction technique or approaching a scene in this fashion, however you get there. After a given period of time, that may feel right to you. And just getting up and swiftly speaking off the dialogue as convincingly as you think you can with the, with, uh, you know, the tone of voice you feel is right, that, that may come to feel alien after you've understood that a performance is no more saying lines like you would in real life as a ballet is walking across the stage as you would walk across the street. What comes into play, what's, what's necessary and demanded of the performance and what the expectation of the audience is, is completely different. They may not be able to how should I say this, uh, describe what it is their expectation is, but they know when it isn't met. And they also know when you've exceeded their expectation, they say, I've got to see this again. One, one viewing of this isn't enough. This actor or actress blew me away. 
We're kind of getting those kind of reviews right now on uh, the matriarch. And I'm very pleased to see that because, uh, you know, there's nothing like the audience to tell you what you've done right or wrong. Anyway, uh, this is my take on, on what acting is, what it should be when it's done right. And uh, it explains, I hope, why if you say or think it feels right, it's probably wrong. I'm not being arrogant, but I'm being very analytical in what is expected of an actor and what you want to deliver to your audience each and every time. I'd like to know what you think about this. My email is cineparis at hotmail.com. My blog is emcpb.blogspot.com. And uh, maybe we'll get to see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.